So in the first uh, uh, verse here that we read, it says, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of the contrite. When I was reading this verse, it really struck me that the Lord says here, not only that he in, uh, habits eternity, which we all know he always was and always will be, but also that he is holy. Those two things we rehearse often. But then he says, I dwell in the high and holy place with him. Who's him? Him's us. I, deal, I dwell with him. So when we can think about where we're dwelling or where we're living, here in Isaiah it says we're living with him. With him who? That has that contrite and that humble spirit. So when we're feeling contrite and we're feeling humble, where are we living? We're living in the high and lofty place. Wow. Wow. That's awesome to remember and awesome for us to know. And then he says, I revive the spirit of the humble and I revive the heart of the contrite ones. So here we are living above, living in this high and lofty place with the Lord. So how do we feel down and out and high at the same time? Because we know God says that's where we live. That's our place where we abide, and as we abide, no matter what's going on in our life, we know God is there to revive us, isn't he? He's there to revive us. And I was thinking of a natural example in dealing with uh, some things going on in the church and some people with different heart conditions and that. And I said, well, well, what do they do for it? You know, when you've, you've got this problem or that problem, he says, well, you go into the hospital and they revive it for you. They pump it up for you. And I said, wow, isn't that just like the Lord? He takes our hearts and our broken spirits and he just revives them for us. And he keeps it pumping and he keeps it going. So no matter what our situation is, we've got to remember he's in this high and lofty place and he's got us there with him. We're not in the lowly place. We're in the high place. And in 2 Samuel 22, it says, He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. This is uh, David talking, and he's saying this right after um, he was, you know, Saul was after, always after him, right? And so here he was talking to the Lord and thanking him, saying, you always deliver me and you rise me up. You put me in this place to rise above, he says, the violent man. That violent man was Saul. He was always out to kill him. Well, in our situation, same. There are some people who are, well, maybe not literally out to kill us, right? But we can kill here. Right, we can kill the our discouragement. It can be killed with disappointment. There's lots of different ways. But what is David saying here? That he delivers me to rise above. And I put over this, take the high road. Do you ever hear somebody say that to you? It's usually when something's happened and you're complaining or someone comes against you. People come against us. I've, I've seen it no matter who you are. It happens, right? And so what do we say? Well, just take the high road. Easy for you to say to take the high road. My road's right here and I'm mad about this situation. Or my feelings are hurt or I'm disappointed or whatever. And you're just telling me to take the high road. That's what God tells us. Take that high road. Stay on that high road. He's going to deliver us from those enemies. Whatever the enemy is. Whether it's an individual, and sometimes it is. More often it's a circumstance or it's a situation inside of our heart that we're dealing with. Or it's a long-term sickness. Ooh, long-term sicknesses are hard. It's just talking to someone before the service and it's hard. They tell you, this is long-term. Oh, how am I ever gonna deal with this long-term? How we deal with it is the same way David deals with it and says, he delivers me to rise above. We gotta take the high road. 
And the Hebrew word daka means crushed, crippled, or broken. That's a contrite spirit. Crushed, crippled, or broken. Oh, I wanted to use a video demonstration today, but I knew it was Labor Day and Mario was off, so I didn't want to do that to him. <laughs> Have him do a video at the last minute, even though he's really good at it. But I have this visual image of just crushing, this crushing. Think about something just crushing, crushing a can, crushing into bits. That contrite spirit, that's a lot of times how we're feeling, that brokenness inside, that crippledness. And that's what God is talking about when he talks about that contrite spirit, those things inside of us that have crushed us. And if you're like me, then sometimes I think, well, I can't have something crush me. I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to be able to get over it. Well, it sometimes it takes a minute to get over, doesn't it? And that's when the Lord talks about this contrite spirit. In Isaiah 66, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one, I will look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and he who trembles at my word. Here in Isaiah, he's saying, who does everything? I do. <laughs> and we've been learning that here, haven't we? That God is the creator of all things. He says, but who do I look on? The one with a contrite spirit, the one that is broken, the one that is crushed, the one that needs me, the one that relies on me, that's who he's looking to. So we have to rest assured that God is looking to us and our brokenness. And in Psalms it says, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such that have a contrite spirit. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. So what I think it's interesting here when God talks about a contrite spirit, he's talking about a broken heart. And these two scriptures tell us that. And interestingly, that's what we've been talking about on Wednesday nights and a little bit on Sundays about how there's this heart and spirit connection. And God makes it here again, talking about how he's near the broken heart and saves that contrite spirit, a broken spirit. He talks about that's our sacrifice. What does that mean? That means a sacrifice is something that we're giving to God. When things are broken, sometimes we take it among ourselves to try to fix it. Last week, we had a nice birthday celebration at my mom's. It was really fun. We had a friend over, and we celebrated her birthday. And so I was getting ready to help her open her present, and my mom handed me this Waterford Crystal uh, letter opener. And I was trying to hold that on my phone at the same time to take a picture, and I dropped it. And it shattered, and I went... I said, uh-oh. Instead of my mom saying, oh, that's okay, she said, oh my gosh, I've had that for 50 years. <laughs> and then I felt worse. I thought, it's okay, mom, we'll fix it, we'll fix it. And there I was on the floor trying to pick up the glass, thinking, I hope I don't cut my finger. Yeah. Putting it all together, and I put it on the counter. I said, don't worry, we'll fix it, we'll glue it together. Now, I gotta, I'm going to go back this week and find out how it's going. <laughs> See if she fixed it. But even if that letter opener gets fixed, it's not the same. Because I'm always going to know I dropped it. And you might be able to see those little lines. You know, when we're broken and God comes in and he fixes us, we're not the same. We're not supposed to be the same, right? We're the same but different. Did you ever hear that? It's the same but different. And that's what God wants to do with us. That's why he's calling it a sacrifice that when we give it to him, those broken places get healed. It's not that we don't remember that they are there, but we're a different person. We're not the same person that we were. And that's what God does with our brokenness. He does with our contrite spirits and our broken hearts is he ministers to those he 
puts those back together for us in a new way, in a way that makes us stronger, in a way that makes us more perceptive, and most importantly, in a way that reminds us who we are in God, that we're the ones rising above. We're the ones living in that holy place with the Lord. He's looking upon us. He's waiting for us to give him that sacrifice. When we fix it in our own, it's not as effective. My husband and I were talking on the way here how life is changing and how as we get older, it's a different season, it's a different time. And we always, we never made fun of old people, but we did talk about them. Ooh, that guy's old. And he says to me, he goes, you know, we're that guy. <laughs> I go, I know. But in all the changes, in all the seasons, God wants us to be different. He wants us to know, let me change you. Bring that sacrifice, whatever it is you came with this morning, because we all have that, and give it to me. And watch what I can do, not only in the circumstance, but most importantly, inside of you. Watch how I can fix that broken place to look different. And when God fixes it, he fixes it perfectly. He fixes it just the way it needs to be. And this is an example in Luke 18 of somebody who's focused. I put about this, it's all about you. I've said before, we used to sing this song here, it's all about you. And we use that song to praise the Lord, but we would also use it at home sometimes when somebody would be a little bit self-centered and they didn't know it. And we'd say, it's all about you. And they'd get mad. And here's an example here of two people. One, trip, one gave it to God and one didn't. And also he spoke the parable, this is Jesus, to some who trusted in who? Themselves. That they were righteous and despised others. Not only did they trust in themselves, but they were comparing themselves to each other. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed, thus with himself. He didn't even take anyone with him. He's praying with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, executioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. Executioners, unjust, or, or I don't know why that's there twice. I fast twice a week and I give all my tithes of all that I possess. Whew. He should have put in there, I, I'm not like these guys, but I am a little bit full of myself, right? <laughs> He's up there praying by himself, and what is he even praying for? He's just thanking God for how great he is. So what he's saying, I do everything I'm supposed to, and thank you, God, for not making me like this guy. <laughs> right? Compare, compare, compare. A sure way to be discouraged, to compare yourself, right, to people. And so this is an example of a Pharisee taking everything upon himself, try, not giving those sacrifices to God. He gave his tithes, so. But how many of you know you can give your tithes and still hold on to your heart, right? So here, he was doing all the right things, but he was missing the point. And then we have this other example in verse 13 where he says, and the tax collector, standing far off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So here is that example. He uses humbled himself will be exalted. But the same thing, he's going to be lifted up into this high place with the Lord. Why? Because his heart was broken. He went before the Lord with a sincere heart, saying, well, I'm the greatest? No. Same, I'm a sinner. Pure before the Lord. And that's what the Lord asks of us. And then he says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. That'd be the Pharisee, right? I would think when Jesus rose again, they were pretty humbled, wouldn't you? And he who humbles 
will be and live in that exalted place and be in that place with God. And then we have this other example uh, from David in Psalm 41 that says, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. So this is the same David before this in 2 Samuel that said, Lord, thank you for delivering my enemies. Boy, he was a violent man. And now what is he saying before the Lord? He's saying, Lord, be merciful. Heal my soul for I have sinned. And we know for David could very well be the sin of Bathsheba where he was unfaithful, right? And he was with another man's wife. And he was going before the Lord with that humbled and that lowly spirit, with that crushed and that contrite and that broken place and saying, Lord, be merciful to me. Is there something where you need to go before the Lord today? Say, Lord, be merciful to me. There is. Because we too made mistakes. We too have things in our life that we ask the Lord for his mercy. And it's through that that God can really do something for us and with us. And in Matthew 5, it says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn and he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. This first scripture, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We know very well, right? But when I usually read this, I always think about mourning maybe the death of something or mourning the loss of something. But here, as we've read these previous scriptures, it can also mean mourning in the sense of a repentance, Mourning in the sense of a mistake that we've made or this gift of repentance that we may need in a certain area can also mean blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. David was mourning before the Lord about what he had done. He was seeking that repentance. He was asking God for that repentance and he was comforted. That's why the Psalms are so comforting to us. This morning we had a big discussion. I'm going to see how you guys vote on this. Okay. So in the book of Psalms, how many of you think that Psalms is spelled P-S-A-L-A-M-S? Psalms. Is that right? Psalms. P-S-L-A-M-S. How many of you think it's Psalm with no S on the end of it? P-S-L-A. Okay. Well, most of you didn't vote, so you're chicken. But for those of you that did vote, we're having this big debate today, and it is no S, although on the computer, and it must be in some versions, we're going to have to to be continued here. (laughs) But when we look and we read the book of the Psalms, there's so much comfort in those books because David wrote a lot of them and he was writing from that contrite place. He was writing from that broken place. He was writing from that place of have mercy on me because I'm in mourning. So sometimes we can be in mourning over ourselves and the condition that we're in or the situations that we're in, not just something that happens to us. And then he says, very familiar leading scripture at Mount Zion, this Hosea scripture. It says, after two days, he will revive us. The third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. We know this is a time like never before. We're living in his presence and we're loving it, aren't we? This third day that Pastor Lauren has taught us about and that is showing us and that is teaching us. And before this, he had to revive us, just as the scripture said, to breathe that breath of life in us, not just one time, but time after time after time to keep in his presence, because it's in his presence where there's fullness of joy. And this example of reviving was a natural, kind of natural spiritual example that I thought was great. It says, but when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob was revived. I can picture this. This is the story 
about Jacob, uh, Joseph and his brothers who had thrown him in a pit and came back and told his dad that Joseph had died, right? And here now they knew that they found out that Joseph was alive. He was a ruler in Egypt. He sent back food for them. And the brothers come back with great news. Good news can revive you, can it? There's some good news here. The Bible says good news is like good medicine. It's good for the bones. And so he got good news. He says, My, our brother, your son is alive. And it says that Jacob's spirit was revived. I wonder if they ever told him they were the ones who told you he died. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say that. But there's something about that good word, that spirit being revived in us. And that's what God wants to do for us this morning. He wants to breathe that new life. He wants to have that revived spirit in us. And he wants us to have that good news and that good report that we pray every day weak about because it does something to our heart, doesn't it? It does something to our spirit. It lifts us up to live in that high above place that the Lord is speaking to us about. And in Psalm 10, it says, the Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. I put over this one, a prepared heart, he hears. But in this verse, it's not talking about us hearing. It's talking about the Lord hearing. So how do we prepare our own heart? Well, oftentimes we don't. Because here it says God prepares our heart. What does it mean? It means that we don't know what's coming around the corner, but God knows. He knows what's going on. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what we're going to face. And in doing so, he prepares our heart for it. He prepares our heart. Whether it be that open heart, whether it be a closed heart, whether it be that contrite heart, whatever that heart is going on, God's preparing it for us and God hears That is such a comfort to know. In the times where we think nobody understands, nobody listens, (laughs) nobody can hear, God can hear. And God is hearing. This morning as you bring your prayers, be sure, rest assured God's hearing your prayer. No matter how many times we've prayed it, no matter how many times we've asked it, God is here and he has prepared each and every one of our hearts to receive that word, to receive it in our hearts and to receive it in our spirits. So we can be like Jacob and have that revived spirit. We can have that alive spirit and stay in the presence of the Lord. And he also says that the man of the earth may oppress no more. What does it mean to be oppressed? It means to be held down. It means that you feel that oppression or that Holding down of a sense. No more. Now what God says, he's going to take that away as well. The righteous perish and no man takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away. While no one considers the righteous is taken away from evil. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in uprightness. This was the very beginning. We didn't read this one, but this was the beginning of this chapter in 57. It says, the righteous perish and no man takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away. So I put over this the time we live in. It's just a name change. The time we live in. People are hurting. People are taken away. Things are happening. Nobody takes care of it. Sometimes a way to say it, nobody cares less, right? Right? All these things are happening around us. And then it says that the righteous is taken away from evil. Oh, that he shall enter peace. That they shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Do you know, some God, sometimes God takes us out of situations to do what? To keep us from evil. Wow. Wow. And I put over this just a name change because this became very apparent to me 
When I was working for many years at uh, a, a business company, and as I was working and I worked my way up and I was in charge of different departments, I thought, you know, I'm kind of something a little bit, right? I got these departments, I got this job. People must really appreciate me. And then I quit because the Lord called me out. And I thought, the whole thing will probably fall apart without me, you know. <laughs> probably not going to make it. But something happened. I became a name change. What's a name change? Well, now there was the title. Instead of my name there, somebody else's name was there. They kind of forgot all about me. And here I thought I was all that. And that's what this is talking about here in Isaiah, that when he says the righteous perish and nobody takes it to heart. Not us. We're called to help others, aren't we? We're called to take them to the mountain. We're called to tell them about Jesus. We're called to be there when they need us. And we are. I always tell people, if you have a need, call the church. Text one of us. Call one of us. Sunday, somebody told me their mother passed away three weeks ago. Why didn't you call the church and let us know so we can be there supporting you and helping you? Because we don't want to be these ones that take no notice of the righteous. We want to be the ones that are there when people need us. We want to be the ones that are there when they need peace, when they need healing, when they need help, when they need someone to stand up for them. We want to be those ones. And that's what Isaiah's talking about here, that the righteous will be taken away. So sometimes when he moves you out of a position or he creates something in your life, he's protecting you from something. I told you guys last week, I think it was, or the week before, about my husband's account that he was for sure going to get, but he didn't get it. And he was so disappointed. And a couple weeks later, that, com that whole uh, account was indicted by the federal indictment. Yeah. That's protecting from evil, right? That's right. And so we need to see our lives in the same way that people sometimes may walk us by or whatever, but God doesn't. God doesn't do that. He protects us from that evil. Something that we think should work out that doesn't work out, most often we can look back and say, it's a good thing that didn't work out. Did you ever date somebody and think, whew, Glad I didn't end up with that one. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Same kind of thing. And God knows our struggle. We read in verse 16, For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry, for the spirit would not fail before me. And the souls which I have made, for the iniquity of his covetousness, I was angry and struck him. I hid and was angry. And he went on backsliding in the ways of his heart. I have seen his ways and I will heal him. I will also lead him and restore comfort to him and to his mourners. In this passage, he's talking about the backsliders, but this is really for anybody that he's talking about here. And he's telling them, I'm not going to be mad at you forever. He said, I was angry and I hid. That was like the silent treatment we talked about. When we're mad at someone and we don't talk to them and we give them the silent treatment. But he says, that's not always. And sometimes we feel like that, that God's hiding. God, where are you? Or what is the situation? But I love, love, love this verse. I have seen his ways and I will what? Heal him. Do you know God's here to heal this morning? The Bible says all that came to Jesus, he healed. We believe that. We proclaim that. We believe that verse. He says, and I will also lead him and restore comforts to him and his mourners. So God wants to heal, he wants to lead, and he wants to restore. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is far off and him who is near, says the Lord. I will heal him. But the wicked are like a troubled sea whose water cast upon mire and dirt it cannot rest. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. 
This morning, as we've talked so many times, we know that God wants to give us a peace this morning. We talk about it every Tuesday because it's the miracle of peace. It's the kind of peace that no matter what the situation is, we can still have peace. No matter what the circumstances, we can still have peace. And he says here, I'll give you peace if you're far off or if you're near. You're feeling really close to the Lord this morning, you're going to have that peace. You're feeling really far away, you're still going to have the peace because God is a faithful God and he wants us to live in that peace, to have faith in that peace, and to be able to be on demonstration. You know, people are looking, for, well, how we're going to react. They know what's going on. You know, there's some people love when bad news comes to you, right? Well, let's see how she's going to deal with this one. Can you be, are we going to be calm? Are we going to lose our peace? Are we going to trust the word of the Lord? I'm going to trust the word of the Lord. How about you? You're going to trust the, the word of the Lord and believe what he says. So this morning, as we think about this scripture and we think about Isaiah 57, I want you to really think about what it is that you need reviving this morning. Situation in your life, a circumstance, Maybe it's just your relationship with God is feeling a little lost. He says that to us this morning, I'm going to breathe some new life this morning. I'm going to revive this situation in you this morning, and I'm going to pour out the spirit of peace. I'm ready for that peace. 